Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Rock Your Best Life podcast. With me today, I have the amazing Michelle Hearn. Um, she is the author of the, let's see if you can see it, The Dietitian's Dilemma. <laughs> there we go. Um, and she is an ultra marathon runner. Um, and she is somebody that puts amazing educational content out there. So welcome, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me back. Yes, of course. Yes, you were one of my first interviews um, over a year ago. Gosh, and I'm blind. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's why I want to have you on. And also you're amazing um, because you just talk about all these things that I'm passionate about and that you're passionate about and that we really need to talk about, you know, um, and you used to be a dietitian um, and now you kind of, you, I love that you um, like to give some education out there about how we have, you know, been, we had it all wrong, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I practiced in the hospital setting as a traditional dietitian for over 11 years. And, you know, that's pretty much the premise of my book is what do you do when you learn that the key to reversing chronic diseases, you know, everything from type two diabetes to major depression to heart disease is pretty much the opposite of everything you were taught. Yes. And um, why don't you give us a quick, uh, just like a quick summary of who you are and what you do now. Um, and of course, they can, people can go back to the first episode and listen to your whole story, but maybe just like a quick sure. little. Yeah, overview. really quick. So I am, um, I'm a registered and licensed dietitian still. I still maintain those two credentials, but I, my health journey basically began when I was 12 years old. I had a serious eating disorder diagnosed with anorexia nervosa, um, you know, went to inpatient treatment through my early adolescence and adulthood, suffered with severe anxiety, all kinds of GI issues, uh, low ben bone density, major depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation. Uh, I was basically just told like, hey, these are, this is your lot in life. You're going to have to be a high functioning human with all these issues. And, you know, I followed the nutrition guidelines. I became a traditional dietitian as well as an athlete. Um, I had a lot of injuries as an athlete. You know, they told me like, hey, that's just how it is. It's low bone density. It's your fault. You know, I remember the uh, trainer I ran in college told me I was, I was paying for my sins of the past, you know, because I was anorexic. It, I was going to have stress fractures. Um, and yeah, you know, when I became a traditional dietitian, there were just things in the hospital setting that didn't make sense to me. You know, for example, why are we feeding type two diabetics who can no longer, uh, utilize and process carbohydrates? Why are we giving them these high carb diets and then forcing, you know, their blood sugar down with insulin? Like, why don't we just stop giving them so many carbohydrates? And then when I, we went to the ICU and I saw how the two feeding ingredients, you know, for people who've had major injuries or you know, can't eat when we put them on tube feeding. I was like, oh my God, these are the same things I was fed in treatment when I was 12. You know, the tube feeding is maltodextrin, <clears throat> excuse me, high fructose corn syrup, uh, soy protein and canola oil. And I was just told like, hey, Michelle, it's just calories in, calories out. You know, it's all about, you know, balance, moderation. And as a dietitian, you know, I just, I saw my patients just not getting better. But, you know, especially as a young dietitian, you're like, oh, okay, well, I'm new and I'm learning. And then in 2019, I had my own health crisis to where I was trying to qualify for the Olympic trials and the marathon. I was training a lot and my health literally fell off a cliff. Like I went from being able to run 60 ish miles a week to, you know, I go out the door and try to jog and I was breaking out in cold sweats and my anxiety was terrible. My muscles were hurting. Um, yeah, it kind of felt like my life was falling apart. And, you know, at that time, my anxiety increased. At this time too, I was eating, you know, the traditional diet. I was eating lots of carbohydrates, you know, and people ask me like, oh, were you eating tons of sugar? And it's like, well, I was having certainly some sugar, but my diet was mostly, you know, those quote unquote healthy whole grains and fruits and vegetables and lean proteins. So it wasn't until I actually um, had my own health crisis that I decided like, I've got to do something different. And it's funny because I was, I was scared to follow a low carb diet. That's how, how much indoctrination I'd had, you know, I, I had no idea, like we're not taught as dietitians that there's a lot of science, you know, now, now I know that ketogenic diets are the most studied diets for their you know safety, sustainability, effectiveness. And we're getting more and more research all the time, you know, where there's uh, published clinical trials about ketogenic diets, improving outcomes for patients with Alzheimer's, reversing mental illness, certainly reversing type two diabetes. 
So now, <laughs> you know, I went from not being able to run at all on a very high carbohydrate diet to now I run ultra marathons. So I run distances longer than 26 miles. Um, and yeah, I'm just passionate about teaching people because I feel like as a society, what we need now more than ever is hope and truth, you know, because I've met so many people who are hopeless, whether, you know, they've tried all these different diets and they're told, well, you're just going to be fat and diabetes is just a progressive or you're always going to be depressed or, you know, and we just know, we know that the body has a trend and the brain, the body and brain have mm -hmm. a tremendous capacity to heal. We just mm -hmm. have to start fueling our body and brain correctly. And we have to stop putting in, <laughs> stop eating things that are, that are going to cause harm. Yes. And you are such an inspiration um, as, yeah, somebody coming from, you were in so much pain. Um, you were so inflamed and then you reverse all that. And not only that, you're like thriving um, <laughs> and you're inspiring so many other people, you know? Um, Thank you. Yeah. Yes. It's just so amazing. And that's, I mean, you're a big reason why I want to start the podcast um, was that I saw all of your stories in your book. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of times I think we, you know, I'm guilty of this. We think that our stories don't matter. Um, and that what we're going through is not nothing big. Cause like maybe we didn't have a huge weight loss transformation with diet. Um, and maybe we didn't have this huge health uh, uh, scare that we were, um, that we healed from, but maybe we have like pain in our body or we have other things that we've healed from through a ketogenic diet. Um, and, and yeah, so those stories gave me a lot of hope and I thought, well, I need to, you know, I need to be a voice too, um, to interview these people to tell their stories because I don't think there's enough. A lot of times we think there's a lot of voices out there because we're, mm -hmm we're in our bubble. You know? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And just, I mean, to your point, I, I honestly feel like that's, that's all that matters is our story. And when I say that, I, I sometimes think as, as humans, and I know I'm guilty of this, we can get very overwhelmed by the major issues of life. Like sometimes I look around my own community and I'm just like, oh my gosh, like homelessness, you know, food costs are rising. Like there's all these issues. And we often feel like powerless, like, why does it matter? Why does what I'm doing on the super small scale matter? But it truly is the ripple effect. You know, when you share your story, when you share, this is what I'm doing that has improved my life, you give someone else hope, you know, and even if they're not ready to change at that moment, what if a few months, whatever down the road, they make a change and they inspire someone else to change. And then slowly, you know, we change our communities, we change that's, I mean, that's how we change the world, in my opinion. Yes, I I agree with that so much. <laughs> um, well, let's let's get into the nitty gritty here. Um, I wanted to talk to you today about you know blood sugar regulation and diabetes. Um, and I know that you worked with a lot of people in your clinic, um, and you saw a lot of different things, a lot of the effects, you know, of diabetes um, and blood sugar regulation. Well. Where now, where do you think that it starts with people? Um, yeah, and you know, by the time I saw most, I, you know, because I worked in acute care in the hospital, and by the time I saw most patients there, it wasn't like they were pre diabetic, or you know, by the time you see people in acute care, more often than not, they have many comorbidities, right? Meaning they also have heart failure, they also have kidney problems, they're obese, there's so many other things going on. And I mean, I think what you asked is the perfect question. Like, how did this start? How did we get here? You know, because this is really bad. Um, actually, interesting statistics on type 2 diabetes is in 1980, there were 108 um, million cases of type 2 diabetes worldwide. As of now, we know there's about 480 million. And wow. at the rate we're going, by 2048, there will be 1.65 billion. <laughs> so it's not going good. That's um, not okay. <laughs> no, it's not good. And you know, the, the food industry and uh, traditional dietetics and the guidelines would like to tell you that you just need to eat less and move more or eat more whole grains. And that's, that's just not true. You know, from what I've seen because we know, and this is hope, a message of hope. If somebody's suffering with obesity or type two diabetes, 
is we have many, many case studies and uh, even randomized controlled trials that we have been able to get people off as much as 150 units of insulin in eight days with a low carb diet. Eight days. Like I had patients that were diabetic for 30 years. Um, So what, you know, what is happening is people are just eating a lot of carbohydrates and it's not just, um, I mean, there's multiple things going on. We know now that we have so many ultra processed foods. Like we didn't used to have, you know, 50 years ago, the amount of cookies, crackers, cereals, Oreos, all these things, you know, that cause these things cause a rise in our blood sugar. Anytime you have a cause, you know, rise in blood sugar, you get an insulin response. And over time, you know, eating these foods, that's basically going to, that's going to cause you to be diabetic. And of course, there's a lot of other factors that go into that. We're also eating way more inflammatory fats, things like hydrogenated oils, vegetable oils. Um, you know, as, as, as early as the eighties, we used to fry a lot more things and you know, animal fats and tallows. Now everything's fried in canola oils and corn oils and, you know, all these very inflammatory fats. So we have a society that is eating a massive amount of processed carbohydrates, which just make you hungry <laughs> basically. And, you know, we have food scientists, people that are hired by general mills and Kellogg's that, um, these products are designed to keep you coming back. I mean, they even advertise it, right? Once you pop, you can't stop, but you can't eat just one. Um, and they affect not just your body, but your brain. Mm-hmm. So it makes it very hard to not overeat these foods. And people aren't just eating ultra processed foods once a week, once a month, you know, on their birthday. It's every day, multiple times a day. There was actually a study that said people eat, uh, the average person eats 19 times a day. And I was like, that can't be right. But when I looked into the study, how they defined eating was um, intaking something that impacted your blood sugar. And when you think about it, it's like, oh, well, you're drinking that Frappuccino, you know, setting it down, drinking it later, setting it down. And then I'm having a candy bar. I'm having, uh, you know, sandwich with chips. I'm having pasta at night. So it's amazing how often we are causing these rises in blood sugar simply by the foods we're eating. Yes. Uh, and I can, you know, I can relate to all that because before I went low carb in 2015, that those were my issues. And I, I ate a lot of crap. <laughs> um, and I was told at the age of 12 that I was hypoglycemic. Mm-hmm. So actually, I remember as, you know, because I started getting very dizzy, lightheaded. Yes. I started having headaches, I, you know, and this was at the age of 12. And so, of course, we go to the doctor. And the doctor tells, well, you need to eat every two hours. And yes, I was going to gonna say, so you better, you better keep carbs with you all day, every day. <laughs> and well, what they would do, though, is they would, well, they wouldn't, they didn't want me to change my diet at all. Um, it was, I need to be drinking orange juice. It, it was their um, recommendation. So I would have to leave class, you know, and I would have to go to the office and I would drink orange juice. Yes. And so... Yes. And I think that's a big reason now why I am still, um, even on a, you know, mostly meat diet, I, um, still have some level of insulin resistance. Um, and I think it was probably from the years of, of being in that blood sugar dysregulation, you know? Yeah. And most people, you know, blood sugar dysregulation is not just type two diabetes. That's a really good point. You know, that's kind of the very far end of the scale, you know, most people don't even know, you know, they're starting to have signs of blood sugar dysregulation, you can, you know, most people, you're pre diabetic, even before that, you might be dealing with some hypoglycemia, you know, if you are somebody who if you can't go more than three hours without getting dizzy, hungry, hangry, Mm -hmm. then you're having blood sugar dysregulation, like that's a problem. That's not how the human body is is designed. Yes. And and I had I had that for years. And I thought it was normal. It was another thing. It was another, I definitely, uh, yeah. And then I, I had, but the alarming thing and the reason why I did go on the low carb diet initially, it was because of digestion and the blood sugar. I thought I was allergic to sugar because what would happen all of a sudden, and this all of a sudden started happening is my hands swelled, my feet started to uh, swell, and then my heart started to race whenever I would have anything with sugar. Um, and all these alarming symptoms uh, came up for me. And I would go, I went to the doctor and they said, well, you're fine. You don't have diabetes. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. doctors are not really taught to diagnose, um, you know, 
things that are asymptomatic of some, like a major disorder, right? Like if they can't see it, like in the medical community, we're very good at like, oh, you have an infection. Oh, you have a massive injury. Like, a, a, like acute care, the medical profession is really good. Like if I, let's say it was in a major car accident or something, you needed a massive surgery, like, awesome. I want to see a doctor, but for like chronic issues, our healthcare system is a total train wreck. Yes. Well, and so I think that's why it's our job now. Unfortunately, we have to be our own scientists, experimenters, <laughs> um, almost doctors, you know, besides like the immediate things, you know, we can go to the doctor for. Um, but, you know, what are what are like some of the signs that people should look out for um, with with blood sugar dysregulation or diabetes? Yeah, you know, blood sugar dysregulation can actually show up in a lot of different ways. Like if you're somebody, like I said, I think a really key factor for me is if you if you have a meal and then two to three hours later, you are very hungry, you have a headache, you feel kind of dizzy or nauseous, you feel like, oh, I got I got to get some sugar, some caffeine. Like that is a sign of blood sugar dysregulation. You know, if you after you eat, if you feel like euphoric and then feel like depressed 30 minutes later, you know, you're getting a huge blood sugar rise and crash. Like that is not normal. You know, you should be able to eat a meal and then move on with your life. That's all food should be. And unfortunately our, our food system now is set up in a way and how most people eat is just, you know, we're almost kind of riding this emotional and this blood sugar um, rise and crash. Also, you know, it was, I did not realize how, how deeply tied to mental health blood sugar could be, you know, if you're somebody who's really suffering with like major depression or anxiety and is, um, you know, has just been told like, ah, it's on your head or you take medication or ha it hasn't really improved, you know, it's, it's possible you have insulin resistance in the brain. Like mm -hmm. you can have, you know, you can, you can have no signs of insulin resistance in the body. You know, I'm incredibly, um, I'm fit. I'm, I'm a runner, you know, I'm lean. I've never been obese. But I have, I suffered massively with depression and anxiety and literally to the point of it's pretty severe suicidal ideation and self-injury. Um, and how we think this, this is a good way to think about this is uh, like epilepsy, like babies with epilepsy, you know, they're born with it. They didn't have a bad diet. They didn't do anything wrong. You know, if this baby is fed, you know, carbohydrates or glucose, they will have a seizure. And the only, or one of the ways to stop them from seizing is to give them a high fat ketogenic diet. Their brain is fueled with ketones instead of glucose. And so we also, I mean, there's, this is newer research. Dr. Chris Palmer is just an excellent resource on this, but, you know, interestingly for myself, I found when I followed a higher fat, very low carb diet, my anxiety went away very quickly. So it's interesting too, that that for some people could be a major sign of blood sugar dysregulation. If you're somebody who, you know, once again, my, there was nothing major wrong in my life. You know, I had a job, I had a relationship, but I still, still dealt with incredible bouts of mental health issues that was resolved very quickly by, you know, reducing the amount of carbohydrates in my diet and massively increasing the fat and protein. Yes, I agree. And I think I, I experienced all that too. The anxiety, the extreme anxiety I had as a teenager, depression, mm -hmm. and then even as an adult, you know, <laughs> um, and then we turn to things, you know, that aren't good for us either, like, you know, alcohol or drugs and trying to deal with that anxiety. So if we can, yeah. deal with, if we can deal with it in the beginning, you know, <laughs> And if somebody has never struggled with anxiety or depression, it's really hard to kind of wrap your head around what it's like to live with that. It's kind of like what it's like to live with an eating disorder. Like it, it, it encompasses every moment of your life. <clears throat> I mean, there were times in my life, I literally felt like I was kind of sitting on the old, the sideline of my own life. Like I'm like, I might be present in a work meeting or something, but I'm just constantly obsessing, thinking, worrying about food, you know, your brain, you can't shut your brain off. And like, there's many different theories on why a low carbohydrate diet might vastly improve this. You know, honestly, I, I don't really care which one it is. I'm, I'm just grateful to be, a, you know, have my mental health in a good place. But we also know that, you know, your the brain needs fat. It needs saturated fat. And there's so many different bioavailable vitamins and minerals and animal-based foods. That certainly could be another reason that eating, um, you know, an animal-based low-carb diet helps with brain function. But I, I do believe there's something to that 
having insulin resistance in the brain. Cause I've seen that happen with various different, um, uh, mental health. I mean, there's a, there's clinical trials going on right now with ketogenic diets and, uh, major mental health disorders like uh, depression, the bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. So I think we'll have some more answers <laughs> when yes. we get like brain scans and other things like that. But, you know, it's my intuition that, um, you know, this way of eating kind of, uh, overrides, you know, you don't have to utilize glucose as much in the brain. Yes. And I, and I kind of, you know, I eat like a high protein diet. Um, but I recently kind of switched up my macros again and I started focusing on the fat and I feel so much better, <laughs> you know, cause yeah, I think a lot of times get excited. <laughs> yeah. You know, well, with just eating lots of animal protein, but I have to often have to remind myself too. It's like, oh yeah, I got to eat a lot of fat as well. Yeah. Well, because I know, you know, and it's hard because I had tried to bring in plants again, um, and then that didn't go too well for me, but you know, it gets to a point where I love, you know, I love the carnivore diet. I love the meat, but I did notice I was having some spikes in my blood sugar. Hmm. Um, and so, and, but, and I don't think that is the case for everybody, of course, but I did notice it with me. And so that's why I started to add the fat in again, um, more, I mean, focusing on the fat. Cause I think a lot of times we kind of get lazy, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, you made up a really good point. And I, I deal, you know, in in my practice, um, I, I see a lot of women, I see a lot of uh, even athlete athletes, <laughs> women athletes are notoriously bad for under eating. It's like, ah, I don't know why I feel so terrible. And you look, it's like, oh, we're having 1200 calories and, you know, trying to run marathons. Um, so yeah, I mean, protein, you know, especially the ruminant animals is so dense in nutrition, but um, it's also very uh, satiating. So making sure if you do choose to eat um, mostly animal proteins that you are adding enough fat, a lot of fat, you know, I, I tell people that like, you really have to go out of your way to mm -hmm. add fat, you know, if you're going to just be focusing on those, those two macronutrients. So I mean, that's a good point to bring up. Yes. <laughs> well, and then let's, let's go a little bit now. Let's switch gears a little bit. Um, and I know that you are giving a talk soon. Um, I am. And Low Carb USA in San Diego? Yes, I am yes. going to be yeah, speaking on the nutrition guidelines. On the nutrition guidelines and um, the history, is it the history of the nutritional guidelines? Yes, it's <laughs> it's how we got here and where do we go? <laughs> okay, no, I'm very interested in that because I remember, you know, listening to um, Jimmy Moore was talking about when he went to um, kind of talk about uh, on the panel, I guess, for the nutritional guidelines to try and change them. And I forget what year that was. Um, but I know Nina Teichel has been doing a lot of work over the years with that too. And so I'm really excited that you are going to be giving a talk about that. Yeah. Nina Teichold is by far one of my nutrition heroes. I'm excited I get to get to meet her actually at this conference. Um, yeah. I mean, the, the, the guidelines have just a strange history. You know, it's, it, it has to do with obviously religious influences, political influences, um, you know, a lot of incomplete science. Um, and then certainly as of recently, I would say as of recently, as of 19 moving forward, um, <laughs> the conflict of interest is just astounding. I mean, they came out with a study that these last nutrition guidelines, 95% of the people on the board making the guidelines have a tie to at least one industry. Several of them have a tie to, you know, over a dozen industries. So it's just, it's almost laughable, you know, and, uh, I've talked to several people who actually went and sat in front of the board of these people and said, look, here's our evidence for low carb. Here's our evidence saying we want to change the guidelines. One guy told me that people were doodling. Like they were literally like, uh huh, okay, what, you know, it's, uh, I, I think it's going to take a while before we see change at the top. If we do see any change at the top. And I think it's funny and sad that the nutrition guidelines specifically state that they are not intended for, um, anybody with metabolic disease, which is like, welcome to 93% of our country. Statistically, 93% yeah. of the U.S. has some type of blood sugar dysregulation. Uh, <laughs> um, they also use the word healthy 510 times within this document, oh, wow. <laughs> which makes me wonder. It's like, did a bunch of people just get together and be like, you know, we just write healthy a lot. Um, 
it's, it's ridiculous, you know, recommending a massive amounts of carbohydrates to a patient or to a population that's obese and diabetic. Uh, so yeah, you know, my, my hope and my goal is to, you know, one, just continue to advocate truth in science. Um, you know, if not, we have so much, uh, propaganda now, you know, mm-hmm. there's all these messages that meat is bad for you. Meat will kill you. Uh, it's like, if that was true, like I tell people, if you don't know anything about science, let's just take a step back. If that was true, the human race would not exist. <laughs> people yeah. evolve eating meat, organs, and fat, you know, plants were in many, many times throughout evolution, plants were non-existent. You know, if they were, it was bark and the plants that we eat today, like nothing like the plants throughout evolution. Like, for example, like peaches were the size of a cherry. They were sour. They had minimal, if any carbs, you know, bananas were super tiny, had big hard seeds They're nothing like the 30 gram carb bananas we eat today. Right. So, and yes, people did eat. We have plenty of evidence that people ate, um, you know, plants throughout evolution, especially if you live closer to the equator, but they were still a very small portion of our overall diet, meat, and fat, it was megafauna is what made us human. And it wasn't until we introduced a lot of the uh, processed carbohydrates that we saw things like heart disease and diabetes and, um, you know, just all these inflammatory disorders increase exponentially. Yes. I mean, and we can just go back even 50 years and look at pictures, right? Yeah, it's interesting. And somebody released a, a, the, the people in line for Star Wars in the 1977. And it's like, everybody's yeah. lean, you know, and then today it's, and it's, I mean, you go and this is not shaming anybody, but you go to like a grocery store anywhere. And most mm-hmm. people are overweight or obese. And I'm not blaming yeah. the person or the, the patient. I mean, we have literally set up our society to be obese. And I, I come back and just we have taught, we were telling people to stop eating real food, stop eating eggs, stop eating bacon, stop eating steak, instead have cereals and have pastas and have these vegan hot dogs and all this nonsense. And we wonder why our patient population is sick and hungry. And it's, it's really sad, you know, and, uh, and then, you know, we could go into too, how, how food costs are rising and it's, it's hard. And, um, you know, I think, kind of like we were talking about earlier, it's very easy to get overwhelmed by the major problems. Like sometimes I'm like, Oh my God, like, (laughs) what are we going to do? Hashtag we're screwed, you know, but what I am proposing and what I am going to end my presentation with is something that I am, I'm calling the protein project and what the protein project, what I want it to be. It's just an idea right now, but it's gaining momentum Mm. is it is my hypothesis. And it is my hope that we can help people, but we can't just help people by giving them information. You know, for example, um, you know, let's say if somebody is lower income and they're working two jobs and they're hustling and maybe they're a little overweight or pre-diabetic and they go to their doctor and their doctor says, okay, I need you to lose weight. Here's a list of low carb foods. Good luck. You got it. You know, Mm -hmm. that doesn't do anything. This person is maybe food insecure. Maybe they're getting food from, you know, food bank. They're, they're stressed, you know, maybe even there's a language barrier there mm-hmm. um, that I just don't think that helps. And that's kind of what I, I've seen happen quite a bit. And so what I want to do is I want to kind of flip that model on its head. I want to, first of all, I think p- people with insulin resistance or prediabetes or diabetes, we need to get them continuous glucose monitors. Oh, they are going to see yeah. that's number one in real time on their phone. What like, oh, wow. You know, I had no idea that my breakfast I thought this was healthy whole grains. This is causing my blood sugar to go through the roof. So they can see what's happening versus just having this doctor tell them. Two, we need to have somebody who re- genuinely cares, like a doctor or dietitian, not just like, here's this list of low carb foods. Like, hey, here's some culturally easy to do recipes. Like, you know, if you're whatever you like, this is what you can do. You know, pictures, guides, easy, easy things. And finally, and maybe not most important, but since certainly important, is we need to give you food. I want like a once a week drop of me- uh, meat, milk, eggs, butter, and produce to the- these people. And, um, and also being followed by a doctor or dietitian, you know, I want, my goal is to track this for three months, you know, have, have people get their blood work done before and after and see what the combination of education actually providing you food, um, and a continuous glucose monitor does. And also just that personal relationship. I feel like we've become so disconnected as a society, like, 
I mean, one of the biggest benefits of being human is loving each other, you know, lifting up, giving back, you know, and I've been, you and I have been so blessed to have our health restored by this way of eating, you know, I feel like it's, it's the least that, you know, we can do and I can do. And, and so, um, you know, I'm really grateful. I'm actually, Nina Teichel is interested in this project. I have a, another lady who's interested. Um, I think we could fund a pilot. I don't think it would have to cost too much to start a pilot, you know, on a smaller scale. But it's my it's my theory and my hypothesis that the combination of those things, feedback in real time, education and a follow up in love by a real human and actually providing you the food would uh, change metabolic health. That sounds amazing. And I'm excited. <laughs> I, I, I'm excited for you. And I will I'm, I'm going to have to put all of those links you know, in the show notes here. Um, Thank you. Yeah, for any started. of them. So hopefully, you know, if we get some momentum and it happens, I'll definitely, yeah. No, I'll... I, you know, and I've been like, you know, I know that not everybody is on the same um, wavelength or plane with like low carb diets. But we can all agree that we do all need protein, you know? Yeah. And, you know, I think once again, telling somebody, hey, you need to eat instead of eating cereal in the morning, I want you to have eggs or sausage or meat is one thing. But I, you know, I'm, yeah, <laughs> I grew we, we didn't have a lot growing up, you know, and, you know, watching, you know, my mom obviously was bipolar and struggled. My dad was working a few jobs. Like, it's not like a lot of people in, in our society don't have the time, the energy. It's like, okay, well, you want me to buy these foods. I don't have money to buy these foods. I don't have transportation. So you want me to get in a bus. Oh, am I going to, I'm going to miss going to my second job and I don't have the money to do it, you know? So yeah. it's like, we think we're overlooking these, these barriers. So mm -hmm. I want to remove these barriers, you know, I want to say, okay, we are providing you the food. And yeah, you know, I've had people come back and say, well, what are you going to do after these three months? How are these people going to, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I don't have all the answers. Uh, but, you know, it would be my hope that if we can get it funded and get it going, that we'll figure it out. That'll figure itself out. Um, so I just, it's just, in my opinion, a step towards loving people and helping on a small scale. Well, yeah. And then if you look at where the funding currently is, you know, um, for low income, you know, I was raised low income on welfare. <laughs> you know and so the kind of food that we got and the food bank and all that um a lot of the food that we got was always processed um, yeah you know well, and if you're on food stamps like i uh, you know my as a as a country 13 percent of our country is on food assistance you know and i i live on the border of oregon and washington it's 13 yeah. percent on washington and 17 percent oregon but the number one item as of 2016, that people buy with food stamps is soda, mm -hmm. you know, so it's, uh, and I, and once again, this is not a judgment or anything, like you said, this is what's available. This is what people are trying to get calories. They're trying to, you know, maybe deal with just hard life is hard. Sugar yeah. makes us feel bad, you know? And once again, if you don't necessarily see in real time, how that impacts you, you're not going to maybe think twice about it. So um, and then, you know, when people feel better, you can't, you can't unsee it, you know, three months of changing your metabolic health. I mean, and my hypothesis too, is that changes your mentality. Like I, I can't go back. I feel so much better. I want to help others. So, um, yeah. you know, I think we got to start somewhere. Well, yeah. And you know, that's, uh, when you bring up like the blood sugar, uh, monitors, that's really what helped me. Um, I was just pricking my finger, you know, I, I just have a keto mojo, <laughs> um, but still I would, I would check, I would, I was experimenting. I was seeing which foods would spike it. And for me, um, uh, one of it uh, is, uh, coffee. So mm. I go back and forth with taking that out. I know it's hard. <laughs> um, but of course we're all different, but there's all these different foods that do spike, you know, our, our insulin and, and it could be really detrimental to our health. Yeah. And that is, and you're, that's a really good point that that is a little bit um, unique to people. Like I, I, uh, I was able to get a two week CGM and I was kind of surprised some of the things like um, they caused my blood sugar to rise and some of the things that didn't like one time I had a yellow chicken and rice and it went like off the chart. <laughs> I oh, would not yeah. have thought, you know, uh, the white rice seems to 
you know, and that, I mean, it kind of makes sense. Those are foods that I, I rice particularly, I might actually use during a run, but I was surprised that even with the combination of protein, you know, that, so it is interesting and it is, you know, it is something that I think can help facilitate change. You know, when you see that you're like, oh, wow, you know, maybe I need to either add fat to that or leave that out. Um, yeah. So I do think that can be a factor in making change for sure. Yes. <laughs> Um, and then, um, what, what can people do, you know, um, once they know that they do have blood sugar issues, um, what do you think is like that first step that they can make? Because not a lot, not a lot of people are just going to want to quit everything in one day, like me, (laughs) um, and be extreme like that. But there are some things, some things that we can do, right? Yeah. And I think that's another thing is you kind kind of knowing like yourself. Like I, I'm kind of like you, or I'm kind of like, all right, let's just do this. And I also was at a point in my life, I just felt so awful that I was like, all right, I got to dive in. But sometimes people are like, eh, I want to fill this out. So I think one of the best things you can do is certainly is making sure you're getting, you know, protein and fat at meals. You know, if you look at a blood sugar graph, like fat is the thing that will really slow down, um, glucose, uh, entering your bloodstream. So having enough fat and protein, you know, and I always start my meals with fat and protein. And what I mean by that is, you know, I'm a, I'm an endurance athlete. So I do take in some carbohydrates with meals. Um, and so I will always eat my protein and fat first and then have the carbohydrates after. And so you'll, you might even find too, like, let's say, you know, if you're used to just having cereal for breakfast, you know, if you start, Oh, I'm going to have a, you know, I'm going to have eggs. I'm going to have some protein instead. You may not even be as hungry you know, so I am a big fan of adding first, you know, add in the protein, add in the fat. And then, you know, you can, you can kind of start to whittle away (laughs) some of those carbohydrates, especially if you're dealing with them, you know, if you're pre-diabetic or diabetic, you know, I certainly would recommend (laughs) easy tigering on the carbohydrates sooner than later. But if you're just dealing with some hypoglycemia or some other issues and you just want to experiment, you know, start by just having more protein and fat at meals, see how you feel with that. Yeah, that's amazing advice. (laughs) Thank you. Um, and is there, um, you know, some people I've seen some people use, like, they'll start to take out some of the processed carbohydrates, and maybe like replace with the, you know, not more natural carbohydrates. Um, do you yeah. think there's a difference with that? Or is it there is, the it depends on your health, though. You know, if you're a type two diabetic or pre-diabetic, or even I would say like hypoglycemic, I mean, you, your body right now has kind of lost the ability to correctly regulate carbohydrates. So, mm-hmm. you know, you can eat a, a banana or an apple and still have hypoglycemia, you know? So unfortunately I always recommend you get, you know, get healthy first. <laughs> you know, it's like, if you, um, I don't know if some, if, if, I'm trying to think of a good analogy, but basically it's kind of like the system is broken. So you really kind of need to fix the system first, you know, and I am always an advocate of whole foods, certainly over ultra processed foods. But if you're a type two diabetic, you know, eating um, oatmeal instead of cereal is not going to do you that much good, to be honest with you, you know, eating, you know, whole grain toast instead of white toast is the dumbest thing ever. That's not going to do you any good. You know, you really are much better off removing those carbohydrates, but certainly, you know, as you become more metabolically flexible and you heal, you know, I definitely think adding back, you know, those whole food, um, you know, like plant carbohydrates, you know, being the sweet potatoes, the things that grow on the ground is much better for you than the ultra processed stuff. Yes, I agree. (laughs) And yes, I was one of those damaged people. And I tried, I tried, (laughs) I did try it sometimes to add like a, an, I remember I tried an apple and we were on a hike and I thought, well, what's the harm in like an apple? And then all of a sudden I felt horrible and my, my heart was racing and, and my, my hands get like really hot. Mm. Um, and to me, and I've tested this before and that is always a sign. My blood sugar is like up there, you know? Yeah. And you know, I always tell people too, like, it's, it's not necessarily forever, you know, like, you know, you're, you're, um, people get like, Oh my God, I can never give up blah, blah, blah forever. It's like, well, if you're, if your health isn't good, like, let's, you know, I always say like, I can eat whatever I want, whenever I want. Like I'm an adult, we're all adults here, but yeah. you know, I choose to get this way. Cause I want to, I want to heal. You know, it, I, I was zero carb for, you know, about a month. And then I was, you know, as I was running more, I started to add carbohydrates back in, mm-hmm. but if you're, you know, if you're suffering, if your health is really poor, you know, it's, um, 
might be the best thing you ever do to take, just take some time and really embrace, you know, a lower carb animal based diet. And then, you know, once your, once your health improves, you can, you can experiment, you can slowly add things back in and see how your body feels. You know, I, I feel like most of the population can probably tolerate, you know, between, um, I would say 50 grams of carbs or less, you know, Dr. Gabriel Lyons, uh, is the person who taught me that the human body's upper limit for carbohydrates per meal is about 40 grams. You know, most people (laughs) probably don't even need 120 grams per meal, but that's the upper limit. So, and if you're a a very metabolically healthy human, you know, you could probably tolerate that. But once again, that's 7% of our population. (laughs) Yeah, I know a lot of us, we're, we're used to eating the way that we've been eating for years and we're used to how our body feels. But Mm -hmm. yeah, most people don't even know how bad they feel, right? I didn't either because I, before I went low carb, um, you know, I had, I had a lot of digestive issues and blood sugar dysregulation, but then the other thing I didn't. I didn't really realize, um, and I was running at the time I had to stop because all of my joints were hurting. Mm -hmm. Um, my elbows were getting, you know, they were inflamed and and they were actually like puffy, (laughs) you know? Yeah. Um, and that was, and I figured I took out gluten first. Uh, that was the big, that was the big thing I took out, but yeah, I noticed that it did take, take actually some time. It wasn't like overnight that all that stuff went away. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, I mean, you know, now because we can Google something in two seconds or Amazon Prime delivers in two days, you know, we we get very frustrated when things don't turn around immediately. But, you know, I always tell people too, like, hey, if you've been eating a certain way for decades or have had, you know, chronic pain or issues for many, many years, you know, give your body time, give your body a month, a couple months and um, the body, once again, the body's ability to heal is pretty amazing, but it's not an overnight process for sure. No. <laughs> um, and you know what? One thing that you do that I love is you make learning fun. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So you often have your wife uh, with you and you do like these really fun skits on Instagram and YouTube. Um, and I want to know, like, how, where did you guys figure that out? What? What idea was that? It was my idea initially. And we were just kind of going back and forth about some stuff, just being goofy. And I was like, this would be a funny little reel, you know? And, um, and so I, uh, often when I'm running, you know, I, I'll I'll think of things that I think are funny or there'll be things that come up, um, you know, nutrition news. And I'm like, this is just so ridiculous. And we're like, I should make a skit about this. So I'll often kind of almost like write the skits in my head. And sometimes, you know, we'll, we'll freeform it, um, as we're going, but yeah, the goal is always to, um, you know, to teach and to educate and just to make people aware of situations, but we use humor because sometimes if you just like, you know, teach it's, it's boring or people like, eh, I don't care, but Mm -hmm. to make people see like, this is a really, like, this is, really bad like this is profoundly backwards but also um you know we try to deliver it in a way that (laughs) is at least somewhat entertaining so we we like doing those yes I love it thank Um, you and so tell me what do you have coming up what is so I just is new for you (laughs) (laughs) well like you said I'm going to low carb San Diego um this week I'm speaking on Friday uh I just released a low carb endurance masterclass so I'm really proud of that you know it's uh I often have people ask me like all right how do I you know because everything for athletes is carbs 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 so how Mm -hmm. can you how can you run and like thrive as a low carb endurance athlete so I went ahead and just put that into a class so that's on um, by the time this comes out, it'll be on my website that you can get there through Instagram right now. Uh, what else? Gosh, I would say those are the two major things <laughs> it's getting. And then of course the protein project, you know, that what I, I want to do, you know, and that's going to take some grant writing and fundraising and other things, but those are the, and then I've got a race coming up in October too. I'm running a 50 mile race at the end of October. Oh, wow. That sounds exciting. Where's that race going to be at? Uh, it's out in Chicago. Oh, wow. That sounds so fun. <laughs> Thank you. And then I I was just curious. Um, now, since how long have you been low carb? Uh, I started in 2000, the end of 2019. So I believe okay. around October. Um, man, almost three years. That's crazy. Time flies when you're having fun. So it, it is. <laughs> and then I was just curious, you know, how has your diet trans? you know, um, changed, like transitioned or 
I know mine kind of goes all over the place sometimes with what I'm eating. Um, yeah. And I mean, and I always tell people to, to be, it's, it's can be scary because it's like, you feel so much better. Um, but you, you want to be able to move and evolve and change, you know, as your goals or life, you know, I started out as, um, you know, pretty much went zero carb just because I wasn't, I wasn't running my health was in the toilet. So I was like, all right, let's just go pretty much all carnivore, you know, lots of meat, lots of fat and, um, did that for over a month. And then I went into, um, started to add plants back in, I some carbs back in as I was going to start running again. Mm-hmm. And I have learned from me and from my lifestyle that when I'm doing, uh, faster, more intense efforts, you know, cause our training blocks kind of go, go like that. We go, uh, least race specific early. And as we get close to my race, I'll do more race specific. Um, I benefit from a little bit more carbohydrate. So I'll drop my fat down and up my carbs that first, uh, training cycle. And then as I get closer to the race, then I'll kind of drop the carbs and up the fat. Cause I'm doing, you know, just longer, slower runs. So, yeah, I mean, it, it just kind of, it kind of works around, uh, what I'm doing running wise, you know, I, I tend to take a few weeks off running after my big races. So I'll go mostly as, you know, very low carb after that. <laughs> Let's give my body a little bit of break. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. And, you know, I've been really happy. Like I, I, I love this way of eating. I love how I feel. Um, you know, I love how just everything about it, how I sleep. I like the food. I don't feel weird or deprived. So it's uh, it's been a really good thing for me. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> yes. So um, I, I'm going to put all of your information in the show notes down below. And um, and I thank you so much for coming on today, Michelle. Um, yeah, and, thanks for having and me. Let everyone know, where can we find you? Oh, sure. So um, I'm most active on Instagram. So my Instagram is, excuse me, at run, eat, meet, repeat. Um, on Twitter at Michelle Hearn RD. And uh, like I said, I just released that endurance masterclass and my website, the dietitians dilemma.net. And you can get the book, the dietitians dilemma on Amazon. Yes. And I encourage everybody needs to buy that book because thank you. <laughs> yes, because it is such an eye opener and it's such a great book. Um, and it's so it's just inspirational. I think so. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah. You know, we, I wanted to create something that like, if you knew nothing about science, you just, it was an easy read, but also if you're really interested in the trials, they were there. So it's on audible, um, paperback and ebook. Yes. And it is such an easy read. I will say that too. <laughs> thank you. Yes. So thank you so much, Michelle. Um, and I will talk to you next time. All right. Sounds good. My name is Michelle and I'm a dietitian. I'm Kareen and I'm not a dietitian. And as much as I like making fun of the nutrition guidelines, I want to use my platform to give back. Don't worry, we're still going to make fun of them. Absolutely. But you guys, there are people in my community, in your community, that are dealing with food insecurity. Eating a high meat diet has changed our lives. And you, Absolutely. And if you're struggling with food insecurity, this is what you're likely going to get. This is an emergency food box, you guys. And if you're looking for the protein... This is what the nutrition guidelines tells you where the protein is. This is not going to contribute to health. This is actually going to contribute to poor health. So what I want to do, you guys, I am writing a grant to where five families are going to get this every week for six months. I'm going to remove the barriers. I'm connecting local farmers with families. They're going to get nutrition education, a once a week drop of animal products, and one-on-one with me. But we need your help. Yeah, we need you to share this. We need you to comment on this. We need you to like this. So if you can get behind this project, please share this video with a friend. And thank you so much again for your support. Hi, I'm Michelle and I'm a dietitian. And I'm Korean and I'm still not a dietitian. You guys, I want to say thank you so much for all the support we got for our first video. We got over 65,000 likes, views, and shares. And we learned a few things. You guys, initially the protein project was just going to be a local project. We were going to do weekly food drops in the local community. But we realized there's an acute need for protein all across the United States. So what are you going to do about it? So I actually rewrote the grant to include not only the local part of the project, but to do one-time meat-based food box drops all across the U.S. And I thought it was really important that our organization be a 501c3. So I've applied for that. <laughs> Holy IRS, the, it's a very arduous, very expensive process to uh, get your organization tax exempt. But we're doing it. We're doing it. So yeah, please stay tuned um, to find out how you can help us, how you can support us. And we really appreciate you guys. Thank you.